the tycoon, the master and his disciple, the private eye, the dressmaker and his muse, the showman and the late bloomer, characters in the latest batch of Paul Thomas Anderson movies, a filmmaker who has reinvented himself from a frenetic stylist into a nuanced observer. How does Anderson create such authentic worlds while exploring his character's inner selves? This is Paul Thomas Anderson's Directing Styles, Part 2. Before we begin, be sure to subscribe to Studio Binder and click the bell icon to stay up to date with more filmmaking videos. In our previous video, we explored the directing styles of Paul Thomas Anderson's first four films. This time, we'll cover his latest five. Be warned, we will be spoiling each of these movies, and graphic content lies ahead. Give me the blood, Lord! In his earlier films, Anderson used aggressive formal techniques to lock the audience into the emotional experience of his characters. Lately, his approach is much more observational, prioritizing the inner psychology of his protagonists and the authenticity of the worlds around them. You can't go to New York without a parent or a guardian. They're not going to let you do the press tour without a chaperone. Rather than externalize his character's emotional turmoil with stylized urgency, Anderson now employs controlled and objective techniques to study that same turmoil that is now internalized. First up, story. One element that has survived Anderson's stylistic evolution is how his character's exceptional ambition collides with their desperate need for family. What connects all these movies, I think, is that they're all about family. People even trying to find a family or creating a family or leaving a family or longing to be a member of a family, but all of that is at the center of every one of his movies. Beneath Daniel Plainview's insatiable drive for power and wealth, there is a deep and complicated desire connected to family. I'm your brother. I'm another mother. When a long lost brother turns out to be an imposter. I'm no one. Just let me get up and go. And his adopted son extricates himself. I'm leaving here. I'm going to Mexico. Daniel takes both of these acts as unforgivable betrayals. Bastard from a basket! You're a bastard from a basket! Are you ready? Yes. Lancaster and Freddy become entangled in a mentor and disciple dynamic. Do you love Doris? Yes. Is she the love of your life? Yes, Please. sir. Why aren't you with her? I don't know. Yes, you do. Tell me why you're not with her if you love her so much. I told her I'd come back, and I never went back, and now I just, I gotta get back to her. Why don't you go back? I don't know. Why don't you go back? I don't back? know! Close your eyes. While Doc works his case, he simultaneously dreams of a reunion with Shasta. Remember that day with the Ouija board? I miss those days. I miss you. Tortured artist Reynolds doesn't find true love until he finds a woman who can also fill the role of mother. And I'm getting hungry. And while Gary and Alana try to fit into the adult world... What are your plans? I don't know. Their romantic connection is the only thing that makes sense. In these films, Anderson crafts complicated and psychologically charged character studies. Sometimes their ambitions keep them isolated. They're starting to get back together. And sometimes these conflicted personas find resolution. I love you, Gary. Next, we move on to how Anderson constructs the time and place around his subjects with production design. When it comes to production design, Anderson's biggest strength is authenticity. All of these films are set in the past, and Anderson goes out of his way to build authentic worlds around his characters. From the costumes, 
hair and makeup, down to the set and locations. Anderson's worlds feel more real and lived in. This has a cascading effect. The actors can feel more natural and immersed in their roles, which in turn allows the audience to see a real person in real setting, not just an actor on a set. As his longtime costume designer Mark Bridges notes, Paul is a real stickler for having a real world that doesn't feel fake or movie-ish. This level of authenticity starts with the extensive research Anderson does for his films. The oil derrick constructed in Little Boston was based on historical blueprints from the era. The waterbeds Gary sells were custom made based on Polaroids from the original manufacturer. The pinball machines are all vintage working machines. The gowns in phantom thread were meticulously researched down to the fabrics used and the period accurate way they were constructed. And the scenes were shot in existing locations including a Georgian townhouse in Fitzroy Square. It is this level of historical accuracy and attention to detail that makes Anderson's period pieces feel alive. They feel much less like a movie and more like we've simply stepped into the past. In the next section, we'll examine one of the most specific and important aspects of production design, color. Anderson indeed uses color in these films but it's difficult to find any strong symbolic motifs or consistent palettes. Instead, the color plays more of an atmospheric role. There Will Be Blood is dominated by grays, blacks, and shades of brown. Inherent Vice has pockets of color, but the overall palette is muted. Licorice Pizza is a vibrant kaleidoscope of the entire color wheel. According to colorist Walter Volpato, one general approach to the colors in The Master was to have the audience feel like they were looking at a 1950s movie, not a 2000s movie that looked like the 50s. Volpato goes on to explain how the wash of sickly yellow-green taps into both the chemicals he's ingesting and Freddy's unhealthy psyche. Lancaster's red pajamas were a deliberate choice that plays into this concept of psychology, as costume designer Mark Bridges notes. The pajamas are how that man feels about himself as far as being powerful and sexy, but it's also how does Freddy see him in these glowing red pajamas? I love the checkered pattern on there, which is kind of like a maze pattern, which I think says a lot three levels down, the maze of his mind and the way he speaks. In Reynolds' studio, white becomes a strong motif. This brings a sense of elite professionalism to his craft, a lack of color also suggests a lack of distraction for Reynolds. His focus and ours can remain on the gowns as works of art. His pink socks also reveal a twist of eccentricity underneath his more reserved surface. For Anderson, color is used for both setting and character. From lighting and color palettes that evoke a specific moment in history, to the emotional qualities they provide for his characters. Besides how the colors register on film, let's move on to how the images are captured as a whole. Cinematography. As we've seen, there is a massive effort made by Anderson and his team to create authentic worlds, and all their work would be undone if the cinematography didn't also share that goal. The anamorphic lenses used in There Will Be Blood were modified to achieve the characteristics of vintage lenses. This included using decades-old glass elements and stripping off reflective layers that typically block imperfections like lens flares. Anderson really leans on his camera to observe his characters, and there are a couple of techniques he uses to do this. The first technique is perhaps the most common, the close-up. But while many filmmakers reserve the close-up to highlight a particular moment, Anderson uses close-ups like few others. Consider the moment we first hear Daniel Plainview speak. I have two others drilling and I have 16 producing at Antelope, so... Ladies and gentlemen, if I say I'm an oil man, you will agree. We dissolve into this close-up and hold it for nearly a minute while he makes his sales pitch. But bear in mind, you can lose it all if you're not careful. Out of all men that beg for a chance to drill your lots, maybe one in 20 will be oil men. Two shots later, 
The camera starts in a medium two shot. I run a family business. This is my son and my partner, H.W. Plainview. But slowly pushes in. We offer you the bond of family that very few oil men can understand. Along the way, the camera gently reframes the shot to favor young H.W. A brief but meaningful moment that asks us to consider the child's own inner thoughts before drifting back to Daniel's magnetic presence for another close-up. I assure you, ladies and gentlemen, no matter what the others promise to do, when it comes to the showdown, they won't be there. Another technique uses the opposite approach, to play scenes in wide shots. When H.W. returns after being sent away, their reunion is full of anger and resentment. In this wide shot, instead of a close-up with dialogue, their entire bodies do all the communicating. Emotionally, you want to see their body language, how they relate to each other, and how angry the kid is, and how Daniel deals with that. You're standing there watching two people, and you see them, and it's deeply moving, because you're not in their faces. The way you would see something happen in life, you had to be a little bit further away from it, and it affects you even more. And yet another way Anderson uses the camera to observe his characters is the slow push-in. It's an unobtrusive way to keep the characters at a distance and then ease our focus on them slowly. Like this moment with Gary and Alana, the camera brings us in to catch this nervous, bonding moment. And then... For an even more voyeuristic POV, Anderson will place objects or architecture between the camera and subject. One common motif is to shoot through open doorways. In this way, we can observe characters who don't know they're being watched, thus revealing their more unguarded selves. This is a process of dehypnotization. During this tense confrontation, having a partially obscured view makes us feel like another guest in the room. I still find it difficult to see the proof with regards to past lives that your movement claims. Would you care to submit yourself to processing? Look through the telescope, as my friend said. Well, perhaps another time. Reynolds' proposal to Alma is a quiet and controlled push-in from under a table to accent this private and intimate moment. To maintain this observational approach, Anderson uses close-ups, wide shots, and push-ins. Let's see how he continues this with the duration and arrangement of his images. Editing. Anderson uses editing in these films to dive into the psychology of his characters. The two main techniques he uses to do this are long takes and blending fantasy and reality. First, the long take. By letting these shots play uninterrupted for minutes at a time, our ability to observe psychology and behavior is greatly enhanced. Gary and Alana's first date begins with a one hour focusing on her. Don't be creepy, please. Although coverage was also shot for Gary, the single take from this angle felt more authentic, as editor Andy Jurgensen points out. Sometimes you just get these magical takes. Her reactions, they're just so good. Sometimes the timing works out perfect. Just staying on the shot the whole time, you just feel there's just something so authentic to it. You don't feel manipulated. Stop. Breathing? Yes. Remember me, Larry Sportello? This shot lasts for four and a half minutes as we take in Doc and Coy's conspiratorial paranoia. You, you can't go back to them. Oh, because what? Why? Because it would be my ass and my family's too. It's like a gang. It's like you're in, you're in for life. You know, when I first started snitching, I realized how often people ask questions they already know the answers to. They just want to hear it from another voice, like one outside their head. Consider how this shot sustains for over a minute and puts us in Freddy's blurry headspace as he ambles along the harbor.
or how this shot gives us the time to observe the dichotomy between Lancaster's exasperation and Freddy's rage. You are asleep. Your spirit was free. Moving from body to the next body. Free. Free for a moment. Then it was captured by an invader force bent on... Other than long takes, Anderson and his editors construct tiny moments that expose the inner psychology of these characters. We see their memories, visions, and thoughts they wouldn't otherwise share. I put that girl upon my knee, Mark, well, what I do say? I put that girl upon my knee, she said, young man, you're rather free. I thank God I have none of you in me. After Daniel destroys his relationship with H.W. for good, we cut to this flashback. Is this Daniel recalling happier times, or a reminder for the audience how far he has fallen? Either way, when we cut back to Daniel, broken, the tragedy is solidified. During this romantic climax, Gary and Alana run to each other. In the middle, we cut to two quick flashbacks of when they also ran to each other's aid. The effect compounds their feelings for the audience, giving us a chance to see and feel what's in their heads and hearts. Oh my God. In Inherent Vice, we understand Doc's heartache for Shasta, not through dialogue, but through editing. A quick cutaway here. With your mother dissolve as Doc smokes a prayer for her safety. And a postcard that sparks a vivid memory. You don't remember the Ouija board, do you, Doc? It had been one of those prolonged times of no dope. You think you know so we can score? Ask. Just do it by yourself like that. With these long takes and glimpses into their thoughts, Anderson opens his characters up to reveal what's hiding beneath their inscrutable exteriors. Now that the images are set, let's see how Anderson creates authenticity and explores psychology with sound. In general, the sound in these films is much more subdued and naturalistic. Something that sets Anderson apart from how most filmmakers approach sound is his preference for using production sound over post-production sound, even if there are imperfections. According to editor Andy Jurgensen, there was only one line of ADR, or automated dialogue replacement, in Vicarish Pizza, and zero ADR in Phantom Thread. The dialogue you hear is what the actors actually recorded during that take. I really wish I hadn't heard this till later on, Cyril. Very unsettling. The audience may not register the difference, but it is one less layer of artifice, bringing us that much closer to the quiet intensity of these scenes. One way Anderson prioritizes natural sound is how he uses diegetic music, music that plays in the world of the film. In Licorice Pizza, there is a massive amount of music playing in the background, like in the pinball arcade. To capture the authenticity of the sound design, the team employed a specific process. We did a fair amount of location recording with songs. It's called worldizing. It's basically playing things, whether it's music or dialogue or anything, through speakers and rooms and capturing that speaker and that room as an environment, as opposed to trying to replicate it on the stage. <laughs> Someone did their toes. Again, it's these tiny layers of authenticity that Anderson brings to his soundtracks that deliver us a more naturalistic experience. For Phantom Thread, the decision to shoot on location versus a constructed set provided not just aesthetic benefits, but benefits related to sound as well. What you get is a lot of little details that you wouldn't have gotten, like just the way the floorboards creak. 
the way things sound is probably the biggest thing that you get mm. that the greatest sound designer in the world couldn't couldn't come up with you'd be manufacturing stuff and you'd be off the mark somehow other than the use of sound to give us that level of reality there is a more overt way anderson uses sound to clue us into his character's psychology it is breakfast time at the house of woodcock and while newcomer alma innocently butters her toast and pours a tea the sounds are grating With the overall mix so quiet, these minuscule moments are made to be just as disruptive for us as they are for Reynolds, thus giving us direct insight into his experience. Please don't move so much, Alma. I'm buttering my toast and not moving too much. Well, it's too much. It's a distraction. It's very distracting. In many ways, it is sound more than image that can transport an audience in the world of a film. I beg your pardon? While some filmmakers employ a multitude of artificial techniques, Anderson does it for real. From creaky floorboards to dialogue recorded on set, it is one step closer for Anderson to deliver us into the imperfect but real world of his films. In our final section, we look at how Anderson puts the final touches on his work. Music. Another major shift in Anderson's style from his earlier films is his approach to music. The most immediate difference is his switch between composers. John Bryan's haunted and romantic modern cues are replaced with Johnny Greenwood's more orchestral and dissonant scores. Much of Anderson's music, especially the source music he chooses, is period appropriate to help establish authenticity. But music also becomes one of the most direct links in the character's emotions and psyches. Anderson has said that there is a horror film subtext in There Will Be Blood, as he partially modeled Daniel Plainview on Count Dracula. During the opening sequence, we see the lengths he will go to for success. But on the soundtrack, we hear a droning dissonant cue, as if we were, in fact, watching the creation of a monster in a horror movie. We hear this cue again later, when Daniel is at his most monstrous, after murdering and burying the imposter. In our introduction to Freddie Quell, our first impression is colored by atonal and oddly timed percussion. His behavior is peculiar and disturbing, but it is the music that fully opens our window into Freddie's troubled mind. Watch your toes. Anderson is also just as thoughtful when choosing his source music and what mood or psychology these tracks bring to the table. Inherent Vice begins with a psychedelic track from the German group Can. As Anderson says, not only was it a good way of starting the movie with a little bit of excitement and energy, there's a really groovy paranoia to it. With a wildly complicated plot and an ensemble of surreal characters, the familiarity of Neil Young's music helps ground the film with Doc and Shasta's romance. On that new home of mine, will you think For Anderson, Young's music does a few things. It adds a sweet melancholy to it. It kind of brings you back to shore. It's familiar. P.T. Anderson's music is just as deliberate and meaningful as any part of his process, whether it's orchestral sweeping emotion, avant-garde, or precise song choice. He uses his soundtracks to wrap his characters in a time and place while illuminating their inner selves to the audience. 
Paul Thomas Anderson is one of the best directors working today, and hopefully we've illuminated a few reasons why that might be. He tells stories about characters with great ambition, but who struggle in search of human connections. He builds authentic worlds around them with period sets and costumes. He uses colors that evoke a time and place. His camera lingers on faces and is constantly drawing nearer to them. His editing can be unobtrusive and he can open up his character's innermost thoughts. His sound design is real and immersive. And his music transports us to the past and into the mind. What's the best scene in a PTA movie and what makes it so great? And what director should we cover next? Tell us in the comments. On the Studio Binder blog, we dive deeper into the work of P.T. Anderson. Sign up for Studio Binder screenwriting, storyboarding, and scheduling software. Check the description for the links. We'll leave you with the best omelette ever made in a film. Just remember to take small bites. See you in the next one. <laughs>